Uh, Alright. What's up, everyone? Uh, Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the uh, eight game early slate we have here on. Uh, what is today? Tuesday, uh, July 4th. Um, so we do have a big split slate here today, you know, naturally because it is the 4th. So, um, it starts here, uh, I mean, as I'm recording this here in about four hours. So I'm going to try and, um, actually for real today, keep this kind of, uh, condensed, not going to go super deep into pitching metrics or anything like that. Just kind of, uh, overall talk about some attackable spots. Well, we got a lot of them, right? Um, really fishy day on the mound, I think. ton of guys down here that I don't want to play. Like, I don't want to go near any of these dudes. Um, and I think some of the other guys that were a little more comfortable playing, in particular at Kenta Maeda, uh, it's, my first reaction here was that this could be a, a super trappy spot, and he could get absolutely blasted. Um, this happens with Kenta Maeda sometimes. <laughs> For those that have been playing DFS for a while, uh, he can he can put up a, a real crooked number to the downside on you uh, occasionally. Um, but, I mean, you don't want to play Freeland against Houston. Absolutely not. Uh, with a short porch in the left down there. Um, you know, in Houston, same thing with Zach Davies coming off a really good outing. Against Tampa, you want to chase that against another pretty low strikeout team against the Mets. Really interesting tournament game there. Same thing with Adam Wainwright. He's been horrific all season uh to both sides of the plate um you know the only saving grace for him now is that this game is in miami but like you got to get through Luisa rise i mean <laughs> uh, no thanks you know uh, zach Grinky. um i don't know he might be in play here i think he's in play same thing with dane dunning he has to be in play we got weather concerns that we got to worry about as well we got bad pitching, guys with no strikeout stuff, right? Wade Miley, like, none of these dudes are going to throw it past anybody down here. Um, same thing with, like, a Kyle Hendricks. He's probably, you know, he's kind of interesting, I suppose, because he's a fine arm and he gets a bad offense. Um, but 7700 I mean, our upside's kind of priced in here, or priced out, rather. Um you know, so like I, I don't know about that. I don't. I hate playing Kyle Gibson. Um, you know, Yankees could be an interesting tournament stack. So there's a lot of different things we can we can go with here. I don't want to target Colorado on the road. Um, I think Brandon Belock is terrible. Um, Colorado's a very interesting stack with the short porch in left over here down in Houston. Clark Schmidt gets a horrific matchup uh, against Baltimore. He has big left-handed problems. Um, and they're going to have probably seven lefties in the top seven guys in the lineup here tonight. Could I single walks the whole country? Jesus Luzardo has some problems with some right-handers, huge barrel rate, and he's 45% owned here. You know, so you got warts pretty much everywhere. Aaron Nola gets Tampa, and Zach Eflin gets Philly on the other side at expensive price tags, you know. So, um, you know, let's try and keep it a little bit condensed here. There's a lot of stuff that we can go through. Uh, of course, as always, and I can yap for sure. Uh, let's just start with Baltimore and, and the Yankees. But, um, you know, I think stacks are very much in play here today once again as they were yesterday. Uh, now, perhaps a, a bit more today than they were yesterday. Certainly Baltimore I like more today than I did yesterday, even though I liked them a good bit against Herman. Uh They had plenty of opportunities to, to really run him early. Um, and couldn't really make it happen, even though he only made it four and two-thirds or whatever, four-plus, something like that. Um, they get a really, really good spot here against Clark Schmidt. He's had problems with left-handers all season long, and, and it's not really getting all that much better. Now, the cutter value for him is getting a little bit better, but he's still giving up a 308 batting average with a 384 Woba and a 189 ISO with 11% walks, north of 20% line drives to the lefties and just an 18.5% K rate. So he's pitching to a lot of contact here and with such a high batting average and, a, you know, not low power allowed here in the ISO number, but slightly low. It's, it's not like a 250 ISO number or anything like that, but it's a high batting average. So what that suggests to me is that full stacks from the Orioles here, including, you know, there's three or even four switch hitters, 
Um, definitely the three, right, with Rutch, Santander, and Aaron Hicks up at the top of the lineup. You can get to full stacks here and go after Clark Schmidt, um, including those. I mean, they're all going to hit from the left side of the plate, of course, against Schmidt in the in the first couple times through the lineup. But then they, you know, you've got uh, a little bit of balanced upside with the switch hitters for Rutch, Santander, and Hicks later in the game when they bring in um, left-handers or, or whatever out of the bullpen. So, uh, full stacks here with very high batting average suggests that, you know, and some walks that Baltimore should be able to, um, they should really put together a lot of very strong at bats here. 80% contact rate for Clark Schmidt against the lefties. I don't want really anything to do with him today, uh, in this particular matchup. I think he's super, super dangerous. So I like Kyle Gibson, uh, excuse me, not Kyle. I don't like Kyle Gibson. Um, I like the Orioles right? Uh, targeting Clark Schmidt. And similarly, I think you can play some of the Yankees as well. They're very well priced still. They got price drops. And I think they're really starting to hit the baseball. Of course, yesterday we talked about them being a good price adjusted stack. And a couple of the guys got there. Anthony Volpe, he's been fantastic recently. Down at the bottom of the lineup, of course, um, Harrison Bader hits a three run bomb that put them ahead in the bottom of the eighth inning. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Stanton had a fine day last night. He came about two feet from a bomb as well. Um, hit the ball hard, squared it up twice yesterday, even though he, you know, there's still variance. He's going to strike out or whatever. Uh, Kyle Gibson's probably not going to strike out a lot of these guys, of course, right, with just an 18% K rate. We talk about this all the time with Gibson. He's very enigmatic. He's super hard to peg, and who knows what he's going to come out there with. Uh, all of his pitches – Right. Um, you know, he actually gave up a third of an out to the field. You know, when we came into his last start, we talked about this, all of the value on all of his pitches. Uh, this came out to a the sum to zero. Right. So he is straight up stone break even arm with three OK pitches, three not so OK pitches. And he actually gave up about a third of an out to the field in his last start. So, um, you know, overall, he's. He's on the downside um, to equitable value here relative to the, the rest of the league. Um, now, the Yankees' offense is still pretty poor, but once again, they're they're super cheap here. Uh, you can play everybody top to bottom. It doesn't really matter. Um, I, th- I think all of these guys, including Glaber at 47, I think there's probably some better price-adjusted uh, second base plays that you could get to today um, in slightly better matchups, higher contact matchups for sure. Um than Glaber, but in stacks, he's very much playable because really he's probably the best hitter on the team at the moment. So uh, like stacks here, really top to bottom, another very interesting tournament game. Got to keep an eye out for weather, of course, but um, a really interesting tournament game. I'm going to leave both pitchers there on the shelf. If I get a little bit of Kyle Gibson, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, but I wouldn't be happy about it either. Okay. Let's move on to the Cardinals and, and the Marlins here. Adam Wainwright, 6,000. I, I just can't do it with him. Like, he's been just absolutely atrocious all season to left-handed hitters, pitching to an 87% contact right here. This is just, it's just awful. He can't throw strike one. There's no value on the good curveball that he's always had. He's not staying down in the strike zone, right? He's giving up fly balls. Just an 11% walk right here, and he's getting absolutely torched by left-handers to the tune of a 400 batting average with a 484 Woba and a 316 ISO. 35% hard, as I mentioned, with the fly balls. or big line drives here. Like, every single metric for Wainwright is is horrible here. Um, now, do I think there's probably going to be some positive regression? Yeah, probably. I don't expect him to be this bad all season. But let's not kid each other. He's only throwing 85, 88 here. Um and these are big league lineups, you know, like he, he's reached the end of the line for sure. And he's got a, an XFIP of six, you know, with a well, whip of two. And it's not because he's walking people or anything. Like he's just pitching to so much contact. He's on the barrel. It's exceptionally loud. I can't do it even in a nice ballpark for him, even when he's been bad over his last couple of starts. You know, I like playing, um, you know, momentum reversals on the other you know, to the other direction with starting pitchers a lot. But uh, I, I just can't do it with Adam Wainwright. There's another guy in this 6K range right at this same price tag I think is more in play 
um, than Wayno, to be quite honest. Now, Miami did just lose Jazzy again yesterday. He's out with an oblique now. Um, so that stinks, but you know, you still got to get through Luis Arise, Georgie Soler, Brian De La Cruz, and Jesus Sanchez up at the top of the lineup. Garrett Cooper has been pretty good as well. Gene Segura back healthy also. And Joey Wendell um, also doesn't strike out a whole hell of a lot. So this is another pretty bad matchup strikeout-wise for Adam Wainwright. Not that he's going to strike anybody out necessarily, but these guys are going to make a hell of a lot of contact. So I like getting to some Marlins if I can, even though this is in Miami. Um, Wainwright's just, I mean, full stacks of my, of the Marlins are very much in play here. Wayno's just, he's totally lost it. Uh, so I'm not dealing with it here today in, um, down at Marlins Park. Jesus Luzardo, he's going to see most of the ownership here. 10-3, I kind of balk at this price tag because this isn't a great strikeout matchup for him either. Even though, um, you know, the, the Cardinals against lefties, just a break-even offense. They make a boatload of hard contact here still, 38%. And he's got an 11% barrel rate. This is very concerning because he's got 37% hard contact to the right side, 192 ISO, and some fly balls. So this makes me very nervous eating 45% ownership on the guy, even though I love Luzardo. Um, right? He has not been all that impressive really all season. His last two starts, he's, they've been really, really good. Probably starting to find it, find that early season form a little bit, but he went a, a good 12 starts in the, um, you know, in, in the middle of what, April and all through May, basically, where he was uh, dreadful, uh, giving up production left and right, a couple of outings where he gave up five earned, six earned, uh, et cetera. The strikeout stuff was still there for the most part, but pitching to way too much contact. I think it's a dangerous matchup for him, to be quite honest. Now, I do like going after the Cardinals a little bit now. It, it looks like their offense and a lot of their hitters have kind of given up um, over the last little while. I think the All-Star break is really going to do them well. That said, I mean, 50%, 45%, 50% ownership, he'll be north of that in a lot of stuff here today with an 11% barrel rate. I think you can play some other guys uh, that don't have to get through. Tommy Edmond, who hits lefties well, Goldschmidt, Arenado, Wilson Contreras, and Jordan Walker. Um so I, I'm, I'm going to have Luzardo, of course, because this is a really gross pitching slate, to be quite honest. But, um, you know, this isn't the best matchup, and, and he's got some concerns here. So uh, I think some Cardinals pieces getting leverage on Luzardo are very much, very much in play. You don't have to worry about playing Arenado or Goldschmidt against a lefty. Um, or Jordan Walker at a cheap price tag, 2800 anything like that. You could throw Tommy Edmond in as well. Dual eligibility, 3800 likely leading off. I think that's fine. So mostly in this game offense for me, uh, but, you know, you just have to have a lot of Luzardo. Um, he's far and away the best option, I think, today. We'll get to another one here in a couple of games. But, um, you know, you got to kind of throw up a little bit in a lot of these spots. So uh, let's move on. Texas and Boston. We don't know what Boston's going to do. Might also have a lot of rain concerns here as well. Um, but no matter what Boston does, you know, you can always play the Rangers. And they put up another, what, 12 spot again yesterday. Um, and, you know, their bullpen actually took a, a, a pretty big beating as well. So you could play some Boston also. And go after Dane Dunning. He pitches to a lot of contact. The problem here with going after Dunning is his sinker cutter uh, slider combination is is fantastic for him. Actually, he gets a lot of ground balls with it and doesn't give up any power whatsoever. Despite the fact that he pitches to so much contact, they're still 35% hard to the right-handers. But at a buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, we're mostly okay with that. Does not give up power. Does not give up batting average. So pretty hard to get super thrilled about playing Boston. Now, Jaron Duran's under 3,000 now. Verdugo's at 4,000. Yoshida should be back today, we'll see, at 4,900. He's pretty expensive, but he's actually more expensive than Rafi Devers at 4,800, which is kind of a steal for him. Um, so at very cheap price tags, you can play Tristan Casas, 2,400, et cetera, et cetera. You can play some of these guys over here. I probably prefer to mix in a righty or two, like a Justin Turner that doesn't strike out also, just for some coverage, because he's elite with this cutter against the left side. So that would take me off of um, a lot of Boston in general, going after Dunning and his pretty equitable three-pitch mix here. Um, 
can we play him? I don't think so. Uh, like I said, in, in the 6K range, there's probably another guy, at least at the moment, that I'm a slightly more interested in. Um, you can hear the trepidation in my voice. So 6,600 has got to put him in play, but I have depth concerns for him um, in this particular matchup. Now, he, he's gone you know, six, seven innings or whatever in a couple of spots. He went eight and two-thirds in his last start, but that was Detroit. Um, and he struck out 10. This is Boston. They are not Detroit. So we can go after Dunning and, um, you know, sort of play that anti-momentum, you know, reversal sort of play uh, against him it, with some Boston stacks if you want. Really interesting tournament play here. Um, they're going to be... It's slightly popular, I think, today, but we'll see as uh, ownerships and everything start really rolling in in earnest as we get closer to lock. Um, like I said, it's probably just going to be a bullpen day here for Boston. It could be Caleb Ort. It could be um, like a Chris Murphy or something like that, both right-handers. You can get to Texas no matter what. It's price tags that are going to prevent us from getting there, of course. We know the numbers against righties um, and, and against lefties, for that matter, too, uh, for Texas against pretty much everybody in baseball. You can play them all, um, so it doesn't really matter. Semyon is still expensive at, at 6,200. See, or excuse me, 62 for Seager. Semyon is 58. Um, Nate Lowe I like at 4,400. This is fine. Addy Garcia at 56 is also not super cheap, but you can play these guys if you can make it happen. Jonah Heim, probably not my favorite catcher play at 47. Josh Young at 45 is a decent third base play, but third base kind of deep today. Um, so, including the Rafi Devers on the other side of this game, and two plays I think we'll get to uh, in a couple of games here down in Houston. Um, so Texas certainly in play once again, but like I said, uh, you know, the, I mean, with Dane Dunning, you could play him too. He's just got to be in play at the price tag. Um, do you need to get all the way down here today? I mean, maybe not. You might be able to fit in some too expensive arms, but... Uh, but you're probably not going to be overly confident with most of the teams you build today. So uh, offense certainly in play here, top to bottom, but Dane Dunning is as well. Okay, Kansas City and, and the Twins here uh, in their second game of the series. Um, Twins got there late. I uh, got there a little bit late. A um, couple of guys had some okay performances, but for the most part pretty disappointing for the Twins, and that's not really shocking because they are a stone break even offense here. 102 WRC+. Plus and 27% K rate. They are not been, this was, I mean, these numbers are basically the same. No, they got a lefty yesterday, but Alex Cox, uh, would, was pretty okay. Um, and I think Grinky might be able to be okay as well. 6,100 for him. I think he's in play today. Uh, I don't like this offense over here. He's going to pitch to a hell of a lot of contact. Let's not, you know, get carried away. Um, he doesn't strike anybody out. But he's very efficient early in the count, and he doesn't walk anybody. He stays off of the barrel still, and he does have some ground balls against the left side. Not giving up a hell of a lot of hard contact. I've said this all season long. I hate stacking against Zach Greinke because he gives up three or four runs or whatever pretty much every single start, and that's all the production that you get out of him. Um, and with a really low upside offense in general with the Twins, I don't think they're very good. They'll hit for a little bit of pop here. Uh, but against right, he's just a 33% hard contact rate. And Granke doesn't give up a lot of hard contact. Doesn't induce soft or anything like that. He still gives up a little bit of production to the lefties. Let's not get it confused, right? With a 333 batting average, 392 Woba, and a 227 ISO here, you know, these aren't impressive numbers. Uh, but I think he has 18 or 20 points in the tank here, and out of your SP2, that may very well be enough to get you there in tournaments, or at least to survive and be competitive here um, if you can nail your stacks. So I think he's in play. The Twins are once again going to be the most popular team on the slate, and they probably should be because he pitches to so much contact to the lefties, and they're going to platoon very heavily. Uh, but they did throw out their lineup here this morning. They've got Correa, Donnie Solano, and Byron Buxton with Jose Miranda all in the top six there. That's, I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They've got plenty of lefties here, and they're throwing out Michael Taylor and Christian Vasquez down at the bottom of the lineup too. So really, they have three left-handers in the lineup with Alex Kirilov, Max Kepler, and Willie Castro. So I don't know what the hell Rocco's doing over here, but 
this puts Zach Greinke even more so in play for me. He's got a higher strikeout rate at 18%. It's not the worst figure in the league, and it's not even the worst figure on the day, as a matter of fact, uh, to the right side. And as we mentioned, doesn't walk anybody. Will give up some production and some batting average, but there's a, six righties in this lineup here today. Um, you know, and they're fine hitters. Correa, Donnie Solano, if you want to consider him a fine hitter. Buxton, uh, I mean, now we're kind of getting carried away, right? But, you know, like, th- this is an attackable spot for Granke, and I think it. Uh, I think he's in play uh, down at 6,100 if you need to get all the way down here. Kenta Maeda on the other side, he's going to garner most of the ownership in, in this game, and he probably should as well. However, as I mentioned, this could be a kind of a trappy price tag here at 7,100, 25% ownership. Um, I like Kenta, but I'm kind of in wait-and-see mode with him still. These numbers are, are just absolutely terrible, right? The suppression, he's got an ERA north of 6, XFIP at 430, 440, whatever. Um, this is mostly inflated by that one outing when he got hurt uh, against the Yankees when he gave up 10 runs in three innings earlier in the season. So um, he's been fine in his last couple of starts. I'm still kind of in wait-and-see mode. I want to make sure that he's fully healthy. Like, his last start was okay, I guess, against Atlanta. Um, Struck out four and five innings, gave up two runs. And to start before that, when he first came off the DL uh, against Detroit, was pretty good. Struck out eight in five innings, didn't give up any production. But that's Detroit, right? Everybody tears apart Detroit. We talked about Dane Dunning striking out ten and going eight and two-thirds, you know. So um, I think the Royals are very much in play here. And targeting some leverage off of Kenta Maeda, um, what I think you can do is, is build a team with Granky on the other side if you need to get cheap. I mean, and and you know build a, a more chalky construction, um, you know with like Houston or, or something like that. I think it's a viable play, and pretty much anything is going to go here on this tournament slate today because uh, you're going to need to get leverage. You're going to need to make some really disgusting decisions. Uh, because there's not a lot of guys that you're super confident in. And, uh, you know, Maeda would be one of them uh, if you are confident, right? The projection and value score here is, is excellent. And this is an excellent matchup for him. Um, you know, but we saw even yesterday that uh, the Royals are, are not a total zero. They're pretty close, but they're not a total zero in the batter's box. They've got some capable hitters, and I'm much more enthused about playing some of them today than I was yesterday uh, against Joe Ryan. So getting to some Bobby Witt and Salvi Perez, he's 4,500. I like this play here as a catcher piece today. Uh, Nick Prado, you could play him. He had a bomb yesterday late. And you can play some of these other lefties. They're very cheap as well. Super cheap stack. Once again, that is in play, uh, getting leverage against a very popular arm here. Uh, okay, Philly and Tampa, two good arms on the mound here. Eflin's numbers have been fantastic this year. Nolan's not so much. Nola's not so much. Ten um, four, I think he has to be in play, and I think I'd probably prefer him to Eflin on the other side. I don't know why. Um, I don't really trust Nola. I've mentioned this in pretty much every start for him this season. His curveballs just break even anymore. He's giving back all of the value on that he's getting from the sinker right back with the cutter. Um, change up his neutral so he doesn't really have all that much of a swing and miss pitch anymore and he's just a neutral you know relative to league average strikeout guy anymore that gives up a little bit of pop he's got a 171 x iso it's a little bit lower than his realized metrics um so that's perhaps encouraging but we're only talking about one tick lower so that's well within standard deviations of and variance over this kind of sample size right doesn't get hit for a lot of average still um, and doesn't really walk people. It's just like the suppression and, and really the on-base numbers. When he's he, he's allowing a lot of guys to come around and score uh, when he's putting them on base. Doesn't put them on base, you know, for free certainly, and doesn't pitch to a lot of batting average. But um, you know, there's a lot of variance with him with a break-even pitch arsenal here up above 10,000. And this is a super difficult matchup here. If I want to play somebody up in this range, I mean, it would probably have to be Nola, but not because I like the fundamental spot. It's mostly because of the price tags of the other guys on the other side. Like, I would rather take shorts on a 53 Yandy, 63 Wander. Brandon Lau should be bra- should be back today at 5,100. Randy is 61. Luke Rayleigh's 49 now. That's egregious. 
Josh Lowe is 55, right? So, like, the top six guys here are insanely expensive, and I think that means that, you know, the upside for them to perform very well is certainly priced out. So I wouldn't want to play Tampa and stack against NOLA or anything. You could do it because it's a super high-powered offense and nobody's going to have it. Um, it'd be a, it's a very low-probability spot because you're paying a lot for it, and the upside is really priced in for a lot of these guys, you know, with all of them, you know, the top six guys north of 5K. I mean, this is Atlanta territory. So that's why I would rather just play Nola and take some shorts on Tampa uh, on the other side. But you don't get leverage on the field doing that. So I'm not super thrilled about it. Um, but there's nobody I'm really thrilled about playing up in this range. So, yeah, OK, give me some Nola, I, I guess. But. Uh, I'm really not happy about it. 10-7 for Zach Eflin. He's been better. Fundamentally, it's a little bit better spot, right? The Phillies are um, not near as potent in offense. But their price tags on the other side, Kyle Schwarber, Turner, Bryce Harper, a little bit more attainable, even though they're not cheap either, right? Turner's 56, Harper's 57, Schwarber's 51, JTR's 51 also. Uh, so this is not great either. So that has to put pitching in play, at least for me and how I play, um, you know, taking momentum plays and, and price tag sort of counter trend plays, if you will. Um, so that puts Eflin in play and his numbers have been fantastic this season. I think it's very well within range for him to take apart Philly here. Uh, I don't want to play any offense here necessarily. If I had to choose, it'd be Philly, but I don't really want to do that. Um, It'd be Philly mostly because of the hard contact issues here. You know, I'm more comfortable going after a good team with a guy that doesn't give up hard contact. And, and you know, Nola qualifies there. So give me that it, instead, I, I guess. But, like, uh, really not excited about playing a lot of uh, either of these guys, to be quite honest, at their particular price tags. I think the upside for them is also kind of priced out here. So, um you know, really not super thrilled about this game. I know it's in Tampa, and I think we kind of have to side with pitching in that respect. But, um, you know, so give me the pitching. But I, ugh, really kind of a gross game here for me. Okay, Mets and the Diamondbacks. I'm not touching Kodai Senga. I'm still not doing it, man. He's still, like, the walk rate's ticking down a little bit, right? But it's still 13%. I, I don't really care if it's ticking down. This is a very difficult offense. I think this is a super interesting game here for tournaments. Um, I don't want to play Kodai Senga because I think he's overpriced. And this is a very difficult spot against the D-backs. Um, I think you can play some of them. Now, their price tags are not cheap either. I have to keep an eye on Corbin Carroll. They might sit him still um, dealing with that sore shoulder. Cattell Marte is 5,900 now. Lourdes is 48. Christian Walker is 54. you got to pay for these guys. Uh, so that's not super thrilling either. But they have plenty of cheap pieces like Dom Fletcher, Evan Longoria, Jerry Perdomo, um, who lost his dual eligibility, unfortunately, up at the top of the lineup. He's 4000 Alec Thomas, 2300 You know, the either catcher, whatever. Jake McCarthy, who stinks down at the bottom of the lineup. You could play all of these guys to make getting to Cattell Marte, Lourdes Gurriel, uh, Christian Walker a little bit more palatable, going after the high walk rate of Kodai Senga. Um, Low projection for him and super low value score at a inflated price tag. I think he's a $8,500 arm here. Um, I know there's strikeout stuff, but there's no strikeout stuff to be found uh, against D-backs at, at sub 20%. 110 WRC+. plus. I think Kodai Senga, like he's an average to slightly above average arm. I don't think he's well above average, and I don't want to go after Arizona with him. Because I think he elevates his pitch count. He doesn't go deeper than five innings because he throws too many pitches. So uh, I say this every start with him, and I think, I think he's still overpriced. Now, the lower ownership today does put him more in play, especially if you can't get all the way up to Nola or Eflin or don't want to. Um, that has to put him in play because he does still have 28.5% in the tank, strikeout-wise. So, I mean, sure, but um, this is probably my least favorite spot of the three you know, uh, expensive pitchers, um, you know, fundamentally. So no thanks on the Kodai Senga. Also, I mean, it's really gulpy getting down here to Zach Davies. I don't particularly want to chase a really good outing. He got Tampa and tore them apart in seven innings. Is he going to be able to do that in another pretty low strikeout matchup uh, against the Mets here? I don't know. I don't trust Zach Davies. I'd rather just play Zach Grinke, to be quite honest. Um, 
because Granky doesn't walk anybody. Davies has more susceptibility there. He gives up more hard contact. You know, ground balls are, are still nice or whatever. Um, do I want to stack against Davies here? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, he just pitches to the 80% contact himself. Um, he's staying off of the barrel here this year, and that's what allowed him to really survive against Tampa. It was a very encouraging outing for him. And if we are going to see positive regression for him, you know, 54% strand rate here with an, e an XFIP of five, but an ERA a run and a half higher. So could see some more positive regression for him. It's not going to be in the strikeout department. Um, so, and we, we got to worry about the walks here too. 53% strike one is terrible. So that's why I'd like to stack against him and, and kind of shy away from playing him and chasing a really good outing for what is overall a well below average arm. Um, Sure, we can get to the Mets here. They're they're very playable price tags too. Forty four hundred for Nimmo, thirty two for Tommy Pham. Might be in the two hole. Uh, Frankie Lindo's forty nine and Pete Alonso's fifty one. You got to pay for those two guys, but everybody else is under four thousand outside of Nimmo. So yeah, sure. If you want to play the Mets, they'll be pretty popular. Probably favor short stacks here, uh, personally. But when Zach Davies is bad, he can get absolutely bludgeoned and totally blown apart. Uh, you know, like he, he could give up an eight spot and two at a third here, and I wouldn't bat an eye. So I think it's a really interesting game for tournaments. I think my favorite, um, I, it's just got to be the Mets, of course. But if you want to play some of the D-backs here and go after Kodai Senga, I don't think this is bad at all. i um, not sure where I'll come in. You probably have to force some of it in due to the price tags uh, on the D-backs. But overall, I think it's a, a playable spot for sure and really not thrilled about pitching there. Senga has to be in play due to the low ownership and the and the upside, um, and on the off chance that he doesn't walk the whole country. But yeah, 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 you're really taking on quite a bit of risk there, I think, uh, in that matchup against the D-backs. Okay, let's move on to the Cubs and the Brewers. Really interesting tournament game here as well. Both of these guys, Kyle Hendricks and uh, Wade Miley, pitched to a hell of a lot of contact. 84% for Hendricks in the shortish sample, seven starts this year, and in 11 starts for Wade Miley, 85% contact rate. Now, neither of these guys really get, are giving up a lot of power, um, and both veteran arms that throw a lot of junk, right? Seven different freaking pitches for Wade Miley, another four for Kyle Hendricks. Both of these guys, I think, have to be in play, um, despite the fact that they're throwing to so much contact. Like, who the hell else are you going to play? Like, you're going to play all of your, um, you know, SP1, SP2 standard types of builds with Zach Ranky. I mean, good Lord. So Hendricks and Wade Miley both have to be in play. Both of these offenses overall pretty unimpressive. Notably, the Brewers against right-handed pitching. Kyle Hendricks has a fantastic changeup. This is probably one of the best. This is one of the best pitches in baseball. Doesn't throw all that hard, similar to Granke. Not going to strike anybody out, similar to Granke. Also not going to walk people or get on the barrel here. So I think this has to put him in play. 7,700, however... This is the thing that really kind of makes me balk a little bit and why I'd rather pivot it to Granke. Um, I think, I mean, the the Twins are a better offense than the Brewers overall, so that puts me on to Hendricks. Uh, but it's, you know, you got to pay another 1600 for basically the exact same metrics here uh, for Hendricks as opposed to Granke's. So that puts me on to Granke a little bit more. So uh, it, it's kind of a toss-up between the two of them. Um you know, this is a, a hitter's ballpark, and you don't have to deal with whatever weather or anything that they got going on in Minnesota, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but I think Hendricks has to be in play here. Uh, the Brewers, they're probably going to see some ownership. Um, everybody loves stacking against Kyle Hendricks, but anymore, he does not give up any hard contact. And these are damn good numbers considering that he pitches to so much contact, right? 13% K rate is not going to wow anybody, but he's efficient early in the count, just like Greinke, he gets chase. And even though he's got an XFIP of five and a quarter with an ERA two runs lower than that, um, you know, I think he has to be in play here because the pitching slate is just so gross. Same thing with Wade Miley on the other side, 6,800. I'm more inclined to play Kyle Hendricks, I think, um, than Wade Miley, but he's moved, he's, Moving a little bit of usage over to this two-seamer we talked about in his last start. Um, throwing it a little bit more. Likes the pitch grip and likes the action he gets on it. So um, 
I think this is a playable spot because who the hell else do you get to play in the, in the seven K range? Uh, there's nobody. So sure. If you land on Wade Miley, I mean, okay. The Cubs are probably, you know, of the three offenses, Brewers, the twins and, and the Cubs. Uh, I mean, I, I think I trust the other two offenses a little bit more and that's not saying a hell of a lot. Cubs are, are, are not great. If I want to get to an offense though, ownership wise it's probably going to be the cubs because they'll be less popular than the twins and they're not as bad as the brewers right so uh, just give me that i like the price tags on them a little bit more really like nico horner at second base 4600 and Seiya at 38 ian happ at 3600 this is really strong chris morales at 43 super playable price tag there dansby's at 42 Right, very cheap price tags for all of these guys. You could play either catcher behind the plate, Jan Gomes or Miguel Amaya, 32 and 2200 respectively for those guys. So stack wise, I think I'd like to play the Cubs targeting Wade Miley. He gives up more hard contact. His platoon split here is a bit more pronounced than the other guys, Granky and Kyle Hendricks. So that's how I'd like to go after, um, you know, those three types of teams if I had to choose. And in some lineups, well, you do have to kind of choose. So I'll probably leave Wade Miley mostly on the shelf and get to Hendricks and Granke a little bit more. Um, and that will put me onto the Cubs a little bit more. I think they're going to be less popular and they're a more intriguing price tag stack that will allow us to get to some more expensive arms like a Nola, Eflin, uh, could I sing it if you want, et cetera, Luzardo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's how I'm going to try and approach this game a little bit. But it's an interesting tournament game. Um, Kyle Hendricks, when he's bad, he also floats this two-seamer, and it could go over the wall um, pretty aggressively here. Because when the two-seamer's bad, his changeup is generally bad as well. So uh, very reasonable to get to Brewer stacks also. Okay, last game here, uh, Colorado and Houston. I want to get to both offenses if I can. Um, I don't want to play Kyle Free, and this is a total non-starter. It's not happening. Way too much contact for here for him as well. 5,200, I don't care about this price tag. I'd rather play Zach Davies um, if I had to choose between the two, but that's not happening either. Um, 84% contact, 15.5% K rate. He's not walking people. Very efficient early in the count. So this does allow him to survive, right? He has had some outings where he goes five innings, even though he gives up a lot of production. He stays off of the barrel for the most part. But that's really to the left-handers mostly. Uh, he's got similar numbers here to Wade Miley. Split adjusted, 285 batting average allowed, 354 Woba, and a 208 ISO to the right-handers. 14% strikeout rate. 21% strikeout rate to, in the short sample to the lefties. So he's much better against lefties, far more ground balls. He gives up 085 ground balls per fly ball to the right-handers. And this is a super tiny field. Like, you got to hit it 315 to hit it out into the Crawford boxes down in Houston over here. And he gives up a lot of pulled contact. So um, I think this is an incredible spot for Houston. For me, they're the top stack of the day. And that includes the totally washed Jose Abreu, who has been pretty damn good over the last week and a half or two weeks or so. 39% hard contact is a total non-starter for me in this particular matchup. Houston, 18% strikeout rate, 108 WRC+, plus, 175 ISO, and 33% hard with neutrals, ground ball, neutral ground, ball to, ground balls to fly ball. Easy for me to say. Um, so this is a, a pretty killer spot for Houston here. Their bullpen also got blown apart yesterday, so I'd like to get to some of the Rockies if I can, because Brandon Belock's numbers are dreadful this season. 333 average in a short sample to the lefties this year, just 85 hitters, but 286 to the right-handers in a you know slightly larger sample. He's seen 200 hitters this year. He's got a 291 XBA with a 381 WOBA and a 240 X ISO. This is terrible. 34 and a 35% hard contact. That's to both sides of the plate. He's getting some ground balls to the righties, which is encouraging. At 36% hard contact, we can stomach that a little bit. But he's still giving up 2.2 homers per nine. He's got a 14% barrel rate, 51% strike one. No thank you. He's got no chase in him, sub 10% swing strike rate. I think he's probably in to get pretty beat up here. This is a good spot for the Rockies, and they're way down the board in ownership today. I think this is a really cool tournament stack. They don't hit for a lot of power, but once again, they've, they're healthy now with Chris Bryant and C.J. Crone at super playable price tags. Chris Bryant is 4,400. Brian McMahon, I think he's a better play than Alex Bregman on the other side at 4,200. Bregman's 44, and he doesn't have all that much power against lefties. 
Ryan McMahon, I think, is a better tournament play. Uh, Elias Diaz behind the plate, very playable here at 3,900. Good pull hitter, good, um, you know, center. He, he sprays it a lot to the center uh, part of the field as well. Um, nice batted ball profile here for a lot of these righties. CJ Crone's 4,000. Like, you could play him, definitely. Nolan Jones should be back. He was at his brother's wedding, I believe, uh, over the last over the weekend. Um, so he should be back today. Zeke Tovar has been fantastic. He'll probably be once again down in the seven. I think he's, uh, is he the best player of the team? He might be in this spot. Um, he's been really seeing the baseball really coming into his own as a young 21 year old. So I think the Rockies two through six are very viable. I'm not touching Harold Castro. Um, you could play Brenton Doyle though. And you could play Jerry Profar cause he's 3,300. Now he's a switch hitter at the top and Brandon Belock is terrible. So, um, I think offense is almost definitely the only route I'm going to play this game with. No Freeland and no Brandon Belock here for me. 12% ownership is a gift uh, in leverage, I think, um, even though the Rockies don't hear for a lot of power. Okay, that's it. Um, so let's quickly go through a view. Uh, go through a review and get this out for you guys. Baltimore and the Yankees, really interesting offensive tournament game here. No Clark Schmidt and very little Kyle Gibson here for me. I'm more comfortable playing Gibson here against the Yankees because – I think the, you know, if I had to choose between these two pitchers, um, because I think the spot for Clark Schmidt is awful, and Baltimore should be able to uh, make a lot of contact and circle the base pads pretty well here against Schmidt. Uh, Adam Wayne writes, same thing with Miami. I'm not dealing with Wayno. Uh, I'd rather just get to the other guys that we talked about. Jesus Luzardo, yeah, sure, but he's very, very popular. He's got a huge barrel rate. St. Louis right-handers with power, Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt. Contreras a little bit, Jordan Walker as well as a cheap, you know, little filler piece. Tommy Edmund, sure, if you want to run a five stack, that's fine also. Very much in play for St. Louis here. Um, but I like Luis Rise. I like Georgie Soler at a 4600 price tag. Pretty much everybody in Miami, I think, is in play also. Texas and Boston. Uh, Dane Dunning's got to be in play because he's cheap. Um, and he's got really good numbers against really both righties and lefties this year. A lot of ground balls and a lot of soft contact. Uh, Boston, though, very playable in, in stacks. Not my favorite here today, but super playable because Rafi Devs are 4,800. This is a steal price tag for him. And Yoshida is the only other guy that you got to pay for at 49. Everybody else is uh, mega cheap. So that puts Boston in play. Texas is always in play, and it doesn't really matter who Boston is going to throw, whether it's, um, you know, we had a, a change here. So they may have announced a left-hander up at the top of the lineup, Brandon Bernardino. Um, he is in the player pool, but likely just going to be a, a bullpen day for Boston, as I mentioned. So uh, that puts all of the righties much more in play here. Marcus Semien at 5,800, still fine. Addy Garcia now um, at Fenway at 56, kind of jumped up the board for me a little bit now that they're starting a lefty. Same thing with Josh Young at 4,500, really good first ba or uh, third base play there also. Um KC in Minnesota, I'm going to play some Zach Greinke, and I'm not going to tell anybody else. Uh, hopefully nobody else watches these videos. Um, and, and I'm going to probably, once again, come in under on the Twins. I don't like stacking against Greinke. I think he's a far better arm than he gets credit for, uh, even though he doesn't. he's not generally a DFS upside pitcher. Uh, this is a disgusting pitching slate in my estimation. So uh, I'm going to have some and just hope the Twins don't, absolutely blast him same thing with Kenta Maeda I'll have some as well because the Royals are terrible but I'm gonna have Royal stacks too uh and getting some leverage against Kenta Maeda I think this is a really sneaky spot for them nobody's gonna be playing them um similar to like Colorado but they're popping a little bit in value and they're still cheap and you can get to the more expensive arms that you're slightly more confident in playing um you know, like the Luzardos, the Nolas, the Eflins, or whatever. Here's Nola and Eflin, mostly pitching in this game for me. I don't like the price tags on the offense. However, if I had to choose, it'd be Philly, and it'd be like a Kyle Schwarber 51, Harper 57. You can always play him. Um, maybe a Derek Hall 2800 or something like that. It's like kind of gross. Um, outside of that, you know, I, I do like Eflin a little bit. I don't like the price tag. I'd prefer Nola, I guess, going after Tampa, even though that... 10-4 um, price tag in that particular matchup is pretty disgusting also. Really not thrilled about pitching there, but um, that's kind of how I would prefer to play it due to the pricing of the of all of the hitters in the game. Mets, Arizona, I'm just probably going to come off of Kodai Senga and focus on the other two guys up at the top, or other three guys up at the top, um, and maybe have a couple of D-back stacks here. Low ownership does put him in play, so I might have a few teams, but... Um, 
Yeah, I'm not super thrilled about it. I hate the walk rate, man. I cannot stand it with this guy. Uh, Zach Davies on the other side. He's playable at, at 5,400 at the price tag, but I don't want to chase a really good outing. He doesn't give up a lot of hard contact, similar to Granke. Um, you know, so if I need to get all the way down to 54, excuse me, 5,400, he is in play. Um, you know, because the Mets offense is, is also pretty terrible. Really interesting tournament game here. Um, I think this is going to play a, a big role in, in what's winning this this early slate here. Cubs, Milwaukee, same deal here. Both of these pitchers have to be in play. Offense is certainly in play as well. I prefer the Cubs going after Wade Miley um, as opposed to Milwaukee, who's going to be more popular going after Kyle Hendricks. I do like Kyle Hendricks a little bit, though, at 7,700. I'm just like, who the hell else are you going to play in this range? I mean, it's not going to be Brandon Belock, I'll tell you that much. Um, I like Colorado, and I do not like Kyle Freeland. So give me Houston, give me Colorado. I think this is a really, really interesting tournament slate here um, because we should probably see a, a good bit of scoring. So I don't know how I'm going to come in. Uh, it's probably going to be a lot of really disgusting teams, to be quite honest. You're, you're going to look at a lot of this stuff and not be super thrilled with it, I think, uh, at least with your pitching. But that's kind of where I stand so far in the early slate. Um, yeah, so uh, good luck to everybody here in the next couple hours. It does start here in about, uh, I don't know, three hours or so. So we'll get this up ASAP for you. Keep an eye out for projections and, and everything. We will be pushing those as lineups start rolling in. Uh, here in the early going. Good luck.